الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وصحابه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين. All praises due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day. This evening, I would like to share with you some dawah related thoughts. In the sense that we all know that it is an obligation on each and every one of us to give dawah to explain Islam to those around us. Allah has already commanded us in the Quran, Ud'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmati wal mu'idati al-hasana, call to the way of your Lord, with wisdom and good speech, and the Prophet وسلم, has already told us, convey whatever you have learned from me, even if it is only a single verse of the Quran. So the obligation is an individual obligation, first and foremost. We are, as a community, obliged to convey the message. But on the individual level, we are also obliged. We cannot say, well, this group or that group or those individuals are engaged in dawah, so I'm not obliged. No. Each and every one of us is obliged. And on the day of judgment, if we do not engage in dawah, we do not invite those around us, our neighbors, our friends, our classmates, our workmates, Those people who we thought were our friends will ask Allah to punish us because of the fact that we interacted with them. We were friends with them. And we talked with them, to them, along with them, about everything under the sun, except Islam. We're too shy to say anything. We don't know how to give dawah to them. We feel embarrassed. I we're shy about Islam because of what is in the media and the news and all these other types of things. So the vast majority of us never say anything about Islam. Reality is our silence, in fact, brings Allah's curse upon us. The curse of those friends who we thought were friends, as well as the general curse of Allah. In Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah says there, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَكْتُمُونَ مَا أَنزَلْنَا مِنَ الْبَيِّنَاتِ وَالْهُدَىٰ 
من بعد ما بيناه للناس في الكتاب indeed those who hide the clear messages that were sent to them after it has been made clear to them in the book the sunnah is explained to us the message of islam ulaika yal'anuhum allah those who do that will be cursed by allah wa yal'anuhum al-la'inun and they will be cursed by all who are justified in cursing you this is very serious hiding that knowledge in arabic they call it kitman al-ilm hiding knowledge which is essential for people which can determine their akhira this is a major sin we take it very lightly most of us don't feel bad about not conveying the message because we feel bad about islam to a large degree we feel ashamed things happen in the news and we feel bad so it's bad enough to feel embarrassed etc then what are you going to say we look so bad in the media what are you going to say you feel i can't say anything to these people but this is a major sin because any time you find in the quran or the sunnah where an act brings the consequence of the curse of allah like when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam spoke about plucking eyebrows for women that the one who plucks the eyebrows and the one who has her eyebrows plucked are cursed by Allah once you have that connection the curse of Allah it means that this is a major sin so what i'm going to talk about this evening is the way out how to give dawa to these people around you how to start conversation about islam of course people ask me that often times and in general there is no one way because each person's situation may be different however the way of listening the way of listening this is the easiest way to listen to what your friends your neighbors workmates classmates etc to hear what they think so what you try to do is to get that neighbor by himself or herself not in a group in a group circumstance for dawa it's difficult because if you're talking to a group of like thinking you know a group of christians for example one christian might have some ideas 
different from the others, but when they're in a group, there is what they call peer pressure. They feel obliged to go along with the general belief. So they won't say anything different that the others might look and say, what are you saying? You know, no, they won't do that. They'll just go along with the general belief. So it's better to get those people by themselves. Where it's a one-on-one -on -one situation, the one-on-one -on -one dawa. I mean, there are circumstances, of course, where you have no choice. You've been invited to a church to give a talk about Islam. Now, you can't do one-on-one -on -one dawa now. You have to address the whole group. But as in general, the one-on-one -on -one dawah is the best way. If you can organize it in such a way that it is uh, informal, you want to do one-on-one -on -one dawah, don't take them to the masjid. It's not because they feel they're in a foreign area they're not going to feel quite comfortable to just open up so you take them to Tim Hortons this, this is your favorite coffee shop so take them to Timmy's and ask them how are you going to do the dawah ask them you've known me for so many years you know I'm a Muslim. We've never talked about Islam. What do you think? What's your idea? What do you think about Islam and Muslims? Let them tell you. It's much easier if they're telling you, because of course, once you open up, and you, of course, you have to tell them, listen, don't feel shy. Just tell me what you think. I'm not going to get offended. You know, tell me honestly what you think. And once you get them feeling comfortable, they'll start to tell you everything. And tell you things you couldn't imagine they were thinking. Some things will make you laugh till you're falling off your chair. But let them tell you. So once they have told you what they thought, you can have a piece of paper with you, make notes, the ideas that they have. Then you go back and you correct their misconceptions. This is the easiest and most general way for giving da'wah to friends. I mean, this is not going to work with enemies. It's a whole different circumstance when you have people who are just your, your sworn enemies. Right? They're not, they're not going to come in that kind of way. You have to deal with it in a different way. But for those people who are your friends, your neighbors, you've known them for years. You know, in North America, they have this thing, you know, you talk about everything, but don't talk about politics and religion. Leave it out. Leave politics and religion out of the conversation. It's a general feeling, general understanding. So you bring it in. But you bring it in through them. Let them express. When you are the one who introduces the ideas, then they get the feeling, of course, that you're trying to convert them. Right? Maybe in your mind you are. You know? And it will come off. They will, they will feel it. They will, you know, and they will not want to talk, and you know, you'll find all kinds of problems coming up. Because it's an argument. There's going to be an argument coming. See, but when you let them just tell you, there's no argument. And you have to be a good listener. 
Meaning the first time they say something that's way off, you don't go, ah, no, 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 no. Okay, just listen. Be patient. Make your notes. Listen to everything. Let them say everything. Encourage them. Talk more about it. Yeah, yeah. Why? Yes, yes. Tell me. Explain me. Tell me. Go ahead. Don't feel shy. It's okay. I'm not hurt. Let them tell you. Then, when you go back now to clarify, then they don't feel it as something aggressive that you are trying to push your religion down their throat. You just clarify. I'm just clarifying these points. You know? You, know? you can, after they finish telling you, thank them. Say, it's great. I appreciate you know, your, your honesty, your openness. And, sharing and so on and so on. Because of course, for us to be good friends, we shouldn't have any barriers. You know, you, you talk about it from that more general perspective. You know, it's just removing unnecessary barriers because maybe there are misconceptions that, you know, you might hold which may affect the way we're able to interact. We want to remove those barriers. Right? So you try to work from this kind of psychological perspective. And then you tackle their issues point by point. Clarifying and not necessarily arguing, right? Clarifying, not necessarily arguing. If they need more information, they say, okay, I didn't think that was the case and so on and so on. They say, okay. Um, you know, if you... Uh, just to make sure that you you don't think I'm just making up something here, you know, I can get some literature or something. I can get some references for you to see that the clarification I'm giving you is true. It's in fact. It's, it's fact. Now, for you to be able to handle this, you should understand that the misconceptions which people have about Islam are not new. When the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, came with the message of Islam, the people had all kinds of misconceptions. There were some people who were deliberately trying to distort Islam and its message in order to prevent others from being affected by it. So you have an element out there that is busy distorting the image of Islam. Now your best friend, your neighbor, whatever, they're not going to be among them, you know. Likely, they're not. They, otherwise, they wouldn't be your best friend. They would be hating Islam and seeking to you know, undermine, etc. So, But you should be aware that there is this source. And when you're explaining to your friends, you explain that this is a source of some of these misconceptions. Not to say every misconception out there has been deliberately created by enemies of Islam. No. So we have those who are engaged in deliberate distortion. From the time of Prophet Muhammad those people who saw Islam as a threat to the status quo they were in a position in the society. If Islam came and leveled the playing field, made everybody equal, all, this is going to affect their status, their position in the society. So they saw this as a threat. So it was in their interest to distort the teachings of Islam from the time of Prophet Muhammad until today. You have that element. 
busy trying to distort in order to preserve things the way they are. They don't want Islam to come in and change things. So you will find historically in the Crusades, during the time of the Crusades, when the church, the Roman Catholic Church, decided to la launch these campaigns seeking to capture Jerusalem. To capture Jerusalem from who? From the infidels. That was us. They called us infidels. Today when you read the newspaper, the way the newspaper, it's we are calling people infidels, right? <laughs> but they're the ones who began with this infidel thing. They called us the infidels. So they wanted to liberate Palestine, Jerusalem, from the hands of the pagan infidels. So they made up all kinds of stories about what was going on in Jerusalem and about Muslims and the idol they worshipped called Muhammad and it's in the bottom of the hellfire along with the rest of us. You know, they had all kinds of stories that they made up deliberately to motivate their people to come all the way from the UK, from England, you know, by ship, by land, to Palestine, to liberate it. The stories they told were lies. These were deliberately fabricated lies about who we were. Because if they told them who we were, what we believed, then people wouldn't be motivated to come. If they told them the truth of what the situation was in Palestine, where Christians, Jews, and Muslims were able to worship in freedom, and who's going to come thousands of miles to go and fight them? So they had to tell a lie. And in modern times, we have the politicians. It's not the Roman Catholic Church anymore. In fact, the Roman Catholic Church is even supportive of some Muslim uh, situations. You know, the Pope will speak out against what's happening in Myanmar and so on, so on, so on. So, they're pretty open. Now they have been replaced by the politicians. The politicians. So they are the ones now who will make statements in the media, you know, point the finger at Muslims, exaggerated claims about us and what we're doing and what our plans are and all that. Thing. Why? Because it makes for popularity. You make these controversial statements and of course Muslims will make a noise every time they say something. Muslims will make a noise. Every time. So it's a means of building your own status in the society. And especially politicians like to use us as scapegoats. You know, they use us as scapegoats. You know what a scapegoat is? Hmm? What is a scapegoat? Somebody to blame. Somebody who doesn't really deserve that blame, but you use them, you blame them to cover up for something else. Right? It's not just somebody to blame, but somebody to blame in order to cover up something else. 
So the classical example we have today is Mr. Trump. He's a classical example. The issue of Jerusalem is a classical example of politicians creating scapegoats with Muslims in order to cover up their own issues and problems. So Trump, because of whatever internal political issues that are involved, took an open position of enmity towards the FBI. This is the first time in the history of American politics that the president is attacking the FBI. FBI usually is the arm of the president. But here is this individual attacking the FBI. And, you know, they're a powerful organization. They've been around for a long time. So they're coming back at him. They're putting the pieces together to link him to Russia. Yeah. And it's get as it started to come, what was Trump doing? He would fire this one, fire that one. And it gets closer, he fire another one, he fires another one. It's getting closer, firing, firing, firing. So it's now almost in his house. So what does he do? He says, Jerusalem. <laughs> Jerusalem. We're going to move our capital to Jerusalem. Really. This is a classical example. All of the previous presidents, all the way back to Bush, and already promised to move. This is nothing new. He promised as they promised. But his thing was, I promised and I did it. Right? So he takes the, uh, the positive side for himself. He lived up to his promise. But it wasn't about Jerusalem. Because when he announced the moving of the capital to Jerusalem, he had to then sign a document for implementation. Right after that, after making the public announcement, then you see him signing another document connected with moving the capital or the moving the American embassy to Jerusalem. And he cannot make Jerusalem the capital of Israel. You can't make it. The rest of the countries in the world don't agree with it. He can't make it, but he can do the American thing and then put pressure on others to follow. That's all. But the point is that he had to sign a document which would require that process to take place immediately he made the announcement he was supposed to sign a document which says okay go ahead and do it to the state department etc what did he do he signed a waiver i don't know if you heard that he signed a waiver now, what was this waiver the waiver meant that this order to move the American embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem was not to be implemented for eight years. Eight years. As much as eight years it would take for that order to be implemented. What does that mean? He's finished, left, he's done his two terms. If he gets two terms, he's gone there. This is a, whoever comes after him, they're the ones who have to deal with that. It was a joke. I mean, of course, the Muslim world was upset and all this kind of stuff, but it was just a joke. It was a smokescreen. 
directing the pressure that was coming on him somewhere else. And of course, the best scapegoat are the Muslims. So there it is. Not the first time, it's been done before by others, etc. And it is standard policy. Blame it on the Muslims. Before that, it was the communists, right? Back in the 50s, you know, 50s, 60s, it was communism, communists, late 40s. Blame it on the communists. So, this is a major source of much of the misinformation, uh, misconceptions about Islam. The other source is the media. The other major source of misconception is the media. Of course, you all know this one. You see it anytime you turn on Fox News or any of these others. You, you will see it, you know, open, distortion, misinformation, just pouring out. The media has its own agenda. Sometimes it combines with the politicians. Sometimes it's just they want to sell papers. They want to sell newspapers. Magazines, they want viewers on TV, you know. That's what it's about. And what brings viewers is what? Controversy. Crazy stories. War. Murder. In our lands. Yeah. This is, so they... Fill the newspapers. Every petty crime which happens in any part of the Muslim world is highlighted. It's there. Banks were robbed in Delhi or um, Chittagong. Banks were robbed in, in uh, Malaysia, KL. Blah, blah, blah. Banks you know, all over the place. But, you know, there's a magazine, a newspaper, actually called... Um, Oof, name slips my mind. But there's a, there's a newspaper, uh, American newspaper. It's found all over the place. USA, not USA Today, but there's another one. Anyway, what they have in the middle of this newspaper, it's an American newspaper, they have state by state what's happening in California, Texas, you know, so and so, all across. All across all of the states listed 52 states there and they mention what's taking place in the states most of the times they're crimes most of the times they're crimes so now if you read that and you didn't understand that that uh, America was a huge country it's almost a continent by itself and in your mind, this stuff is going on. You see what is going on. You'd think that America is a total madhouse. All these crimes. Incredible amount of crimes. But see, it's just on that middle page. USA Today. It is USA Today is what it's called. USA Today. If that was on the front page of newspapers... All of these crimes, you had to put this. They would fill up the, you know, the first half of the newspaper is just crimes across America. Then, what are you going to think about America? So they do that to us. They don't do it to themselves. They don't do it to themselves. That's the only one. USA Today is the only one that I've seen doing that. For whatever reason they do it, they do it. But you can see it. So, crimes in America don't sell papers. Ten people were shot in New York. 
today. <laughs> Ten people were shot yesterday. Ten people will be shot tomorrow. <laughs> it's, no, it's no problem, no issue. You know, it doesn't sell news. It doesn't sell papers. Telling people at the end of the year, okay, uh, you know, we had 6,000 people were killed in New York City in 2017. Is that going to sell a newspaper? No. In 2016, it happened too. In 2015 also. It's, it's, it's not news. So they don't put that. It doesn't sell. But if you say 10 people were shot in Riyadh. Oh, man, that will be front page. They will bring all kinds of pictures and stories and, you know, news reporters giving their views and why and blah, 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 blah. blah. <laughs> That's the media. That's the media. And that's how they operate. So, you have to be aware of these major sources. Politicians and the media, these two major sources for distortion. And be able to explain that to people. That is just a matter of deliberate distortion for personal gain. But then, at the same time, we have to realize that there is some distortion, misunderstandings, misconceptions, etc., which are inadvertent. Min inadvertent. Meaning, it was not intended. It was an intended distortion. It is just a misinterpretation. Huh? Just a misinterpretation. For example, when I went to Medina, from Toronto, I got accepted. Myself and Abdullah Hakim Quick, we were accepted to study in Medina back in 1973. At a time when those two scholarships were offered and nobody wanted it. Nobody was interested. Alhamdulillah. It was just handed to us on a platter. Anyway, went to Medina to study. And then we made friends with Muslims from other parts of the world. And many of our Arab friends, you know, As a show of friendships, they would take hold of our hands. Right? They would hold our hands. <laughs> now, we were not used to that at all. In those days, maybe it's not so much the same today, but in those days, you know, men who hold hands <laughs> you understand? <laughs> you know, our known gays, queers, you know, homosexuals, etc. This is what's happening. So, you know, of course, when they took our hand, oh, we put our hand away. <laughs> you, know, you know, this was our response. We had to pull our hands out when the people were trying to hold our hands, you know. And we even talked about, why is these guys, why are they always trying to hold our hands? <laughs> we were talking amongst ourselves. What's going on? Are they all homos? <laughs> this is just misinterpretation. Eventually, we came to understand that was just it's just a different culture. You know, people are closer. They get you know. There's not that space that bubble that you have to have around yourself that people don't get any closer than this point. So that's just innocent. Yeah. Also, when non-Muslims hear that inheritance is divided two to one, two parts to the male, one to the female, this sounds to them like unfairness that the Islam
Islamic system of inheritance is unfair. It favors males. You know? And that's why in the courts here, their principle is 50-50. You get divorced, you get inheritance, inheritance divided equally, males, females. So for them, that's fair. That's justice. Years back in their own history, the woman used to get nothing. Yeah. In their own history, go back to the turn of the century, you know, 1800s and before, the women got nothing. The men took everything. So even from back then, we were doing better. You know, at least it was two to one. But they don't understand that the role of the male is different from the role of the female because they, they got into this uh, you know, equality, men and women, no difference between the men and the women. And, you know, equality in, in a sense that Islam does not agree. For us, equality is equality before God. We are equally obliged to worship God. The reward from worshiping God is equal for a man and a woman. Men don't get more, two times the reward, than women for worshiping God. So, this has to do with Social organization. How do you organize a society? Who has responsibilities? How are rights distributed? Obligations, etc. That's what it has to do with. Because males are given double the responsibility of females. So, Logically speaking, if you're dividing and the male has double the responsibility, then you have to take that into account. So it's actually quite reasonable and logical, if understood. If the principle under it is understood. If the principle is not understood, then on the face it looks to be unfair. So we shouldn't be upset when they say that, yeah, your system of inheritance is, you know, it's unfair. Don't be offended because they're looking at it from their perspective. And in their system, their perspective, it is unfair. But understanding it from our perspective, it is in fact fair. To split it 50-50 is unfair. So this is an inadvertent misunderstanding. Another source of misunderstandings, and this is a big one for us. Is Muslim malpractice. Muslims doing things which are labeled as Islam and really it's just bad practice amongst Muslims. Muslims doing things which are really not a part of Islam at all, but it's been associated with Islam because there are Muslim people doing these things. So, when you come across suicide bombing, honor killing, forced marriage, Female genital mutilation. We have a whole big long list. Muslim malpractice. Now, your friend may ask you, how do we know that this is Muslim malpractice? And not just something you're doing and you're just trying to cover it up. 
how do we distinguish between what is truly Muslim practice and what is Muslim malpractice? And that's a reasonable request, right? Because for them, they don't have any way of determining which is which. It looks all the same. It's Muslims doing it here, and Muslims doing it there. There you're saying it's malpractice, here you're saying it's okay. So how? So we explain to them that as a general rule of thumb, a general rule of thumb, which is not 100% sure, but maybe around 90%. If you see a practice which is done everywhere you go amongst the Muslim communities, whether you go from Guyana, South America, to Mindanao, Southern Philippines, Muslims are doing it everywhere you go. Know that that is Muslim practice. But where you see something in Sudan, but you don't see it anywhere else, or in Turkey, or in Pakistan, or in Gambia, only in Suriname, then most likely 90% certain this is a Muslim malpractice. Something Muslims are doing which are not, is not really a part of Islam. So you can give them that general rule of thumb to be able to make that distinction. To help them. Now, I don't know how much time do we have? Huh? What, how, how long is this session supposed to be for? Nine. Till nine? Mm -hmm. Okay. There are common um, <clears throat> misconceptions I'm going to mention, just at least running through them, giving you a general idea. Some are religious related, some are social, some are unique features and concepts in Islam. From a religious perspective, you can try to clarify, especially if dealing with people who are coming from Christian backgrounds. They generally think, or they generally have heard that Muslims don't believe in Jesus. That's how they, they get it. Muslims don't believe in Jesus. So, clarifying that point, and it's better, as I said, to let them say what they heard. Right? But it may be necessary because this is um, more particularly religious related that maybe you might have to uh, encourage them to say something about that. You know, what, what, what do you think that Muslims feel about Jesus? You, know, you may have to, to get them to speak, you may have to prod them sometimes to get them to express what they're thinking. So this is a good one to focus on because commonly they have this misconception that we don't believe in Jesus. So, of course, you can clarify to them that we believe in Jesus. In their mind, it means we don't believe, that some of them, more a little more educated, we may say, well, yeah, we know that Muslims believe in Jesus, but they don't believe in the virgin birth. So they say, this is the virgin birth. Meaning that Jesus was born without a father. So you clarify for them, yeah, we believe in the virgin birth. So you really? For many of them, it's a big eye-opener. They, they never imagined that. You know, that can help to bring 
build uh, uh, bridges with them. You can even take it further that, hey, not only do we believe in the virgin birth, but one of the chapters of the Quran, chapter 19, is called Mary. Really? In your Quran? You have a chapter called Mary, named after the mother of Jesus? It's a big surprise. You would be surprised how many Christians have no idea about that. See, and by see, this is something which is not uh, controversial in the sense of argumentative, which you're now going to go in to attack them about their beliefs and how they. You're just clarifying what are our beliefs. See, this is non-aggressive. This is a non-aggressive way to carry our message across to them. You'd be surprised to know how many Christians believe that we worship the Kaaba. They see the Hindus bowing to their idols and they see Muslims bowing to the Kaaba. People who bow to these things worship them. That's their conclusion. And of course, many of us in our homes, we will have a prayer place and then we have a picture of the Kaaba in front of it. Or even on the prayer mat itself, we got a Kaaba. So hey, <laughs> we have made it worse. We have made it for them even worse. So don't be surprised that they have this point of view. So then you clarify to them, no, no, actually we're not worshipping the Kaaba. It's just direction of worship. As the Jews worship in the direction of Jerusalem, we worship in the direction of the Kaaba. Direction. And you can even make it even more light say well you know in our prayer what we do when we worship you know you all in the church for example you sit in the church and you go on your knees or whatever you hold up your hands and that's your prayer but for us you know we we bow you know and prostrate so we bow imagine if we didn't have a clear direction of worship you just go in the masjid you can turn any direction you want and bow what's going to happen they would be bouncing into each other, bunking your heads together, and you know, hitting this one and that one. It'd be confusion. You need to have a clear direction. So, you know, this orders our prayer because of the nature of our prayer, and so on and so forth. And, you know, usually they can appreciate that. You know. And of course, you know, when you're doing this kind of explanations, you can, if you have ready with you, you can slip in. Well, you know, Jesus used to bow too, you know. And used to prostrate the way we do. For most Christians, oh, ah, no, 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 no. That's you guys, you know. You do this bowing and prostrate. No, no, no. Jesus also did it. They say, no, no, that's not true. I've read the Bible from cover to cover. I never came across that. Okay, here's the verse. Boom, boom, boom. Really? It's an eye-opener. You're not arguing. Again, you're not getting into a theological argument with them. No, no. You're just revealing to them things that they don't know about their own religion in a light way. For many of them, once you hear the word jihad, you know, what does it mean? Kill the kuffar. Who are the kuffar? Everybody who is not a Muslim. Right? So, in their, what they have heard, etc., this jihad thing is just Muslims going around killing non-Muslims. Mostly. So, again, this is a point clarifying that this term has been misused, distorted, etc., etc., its original meanings, and so you give them the clarification, you know. 
And, I mean, you should be pre prepared. If you're going to sit down to discuss with them, you should be prepared to give them the necessary information of clarification. Well, these are the common misconceptions. I'm just mentioning the most common. Most people hold this. The fourth major area is that Sharia. The issue of Sharia. Muslims and Sharia. Right? In the U.S., I think it was 14 or 15 different states passed laws against the application of Sharia. You ask these people, these legislators, etc., well, well, what, what does Sharia mean? They say, blowing yourself up, you know. Their, their idea of Sharia, I say, listen, Sharia is praying five times a day. You understand? So when you say you were banning Sharia, you're saying you're banning Muslims from praying. This is this misunderstanding, misconception. And of course, you know, we have amongst us the brothers who will be demonstrating in some of our some of the countries in the West with big signs saying, you know, apply the Sharia. You know, we're gonna apply the Sharia here, you know. It's idiotic. But they also contribute to that misunderstanding. On a social level, <clears throat> the role of the guardian in Islam, they look at as being offensive. The role of the guardian, the wali in Islam. Because the woman cannot marry without the permission of her wali. And what's happening in different parts of the West, it's existing in the Muslim world, is that the wali forces the woman to marry whoever they decide as a family that this person should marry. They're being forced. So it's forced marriage. That's really what's at the core and the essence of it. Forced marriage. So Muslim malpractice supports this. So many cases that happens here in Canada and the UK and the US and so and so. Parents, Muslim parents forcing their children to marry who they don't want to marry. And the main agent is the wali. So they look at this whole wilaya aspect as being oppression of women. They don't have the right to choose who they want to marry. And of course, this is not true. Islamically. Yes, the wali has the final say, etc. in regards to marriage. But the intention, what is behind the wali? What is the intention behind it? To prevent the woman from marrying? No. The intention is to protect the woman in the preliminaries to marriage. Because if she is left to only choose a husband based on whoever she meets or whatever, males, we know, will say whatever the woman wants to hear. If they just meet and chat and what's whatever, then the Male, he wants to marry this woman. He wants her. So he'll say whatever he, she wants to hear. Make her think that, yeah, this is the perfect, this is Prince Charming right here. The wali is there to provide a male perspective. Because 
men know men. So he can't run that game on the wali. He can run it on the woman, the young lady, but he can't run it on the father or the brother, whatever. So it's for her protection. Not to force her into marriages that she doesn't want to be married. But unfortunately, in many parts of the Muslim world, it has become that. The woman is forced. She may be forced with threats, you know, not just physical, but with threats. You don't marry this person, you're no longer from our family. Finish. Yeah. Woman put in that position, what's she going to do? Go and say, okay, no problem. See you later. No. In our societies, no. Maybe in North America, yes. You may find some girls will say that. No, you know, father says that. Says, okay, let me pack my bags and get out of here. Okay. So, but in general, because of the nature of responsibility, rights, obligations in the Islamic family structure, then the role of the wali is protection of the woman to help her to choose the right husband. That's the purpose. Well, we have to clarify that. We have also female genital mutilation. This is one of the channels that much of the West focuses on. They want to distort the image of Islam. They come in with this female genital mutilation. How many of you have heard of this term before? Put your hand up, let me see. FGM, female genital mutilation. Okay. See, some of you never heard it. What is it talking about? Circumcision. That's the whole issue. It's one of circumcision. Huh? Plus? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the details. Circumcision is the general terminology in the khitan, you know, in Arabic. It is circumcision. That's, that's what it is supposed to be. But where it becomes distorted, traditional practices from certain cultures, it is confined to a particular part of the world from Egypt down on the east coast of Africa. It is fairly common there, Sudan, Ethiopia, Kenya, these countries, that area, which was in existence before the coming of Islam. And Islam, after coming there, this was not reformed. It was just brought in by the people with them into Islam. Justified under the general heading of female circumcision. So the general practice, it does have an origin in Islamic law, which is there in the Sharia, as something permissible. The Prophet ﷺ permitted it. But he permitted it with the condition that it be very mild. As men are circumcised, it is, some people in the West also call it male genital mutilation. You do have that. You have campaigns against male circumcision. But it has been shown medically, you know, to be beneficial for this reason, that reason, the other. And the mass of the people in the world, they do accept it. Not necessarily that they practice it, but it's accepted that some people practice it. It's okay. No problem. But the reality is that if we're going to deal with circumcision, which the Prophet ﷺ spoke about as being mild, 
telling the women of Medina who are doing it to, to make it very, very light. How do you define what is light? The simple definition, this is where the point comes up. The simple definition is that whatever you remove from the male that doesn't affect himself, you may remove from the female. You don't do any more than that. Once you get into mutilation, then you're talking about cutting out body parts. This is what you're doing. You're cutting out body parts. You're affecting her um, ability to enjoy the sexual act, etc., and things connected to that. That's you've gone to the extreme right there. So if as when you remove a foreskin for a male, it doesn't affect you. You know? It's light, mild. The similar, in other words, what's good for the male is good for the female. You don't make a distinction in this manner. The other major area is that of hijab. And what does hijab mean? Why was hijab instituted? In the West, of course, they see hijab as oppression. Women forced to cover themselves and so on, so on, so on. So again, this is an area that you can bring the clarification because likely they're going to bring it up. And they have, on the internet, you can go on the internet. Some people have already gathered some of these things already that you can easily show them. Where in Europe, you know, back in the 13th century, 12th century, and beyond, and before, women wore hijab. Hijab very similar to the hijab that Muslims wear today. It was the norm. Not wearing hijab was considered low class, you know. And even there are references in the Bible about praying for women to pray without their heads covered. That one who does so should have her head shaved. So this has been a part of tradition even in the West. So that's easy to clarify. And also the issue of separation in the masjid. Separation of sexes in prayer. Men pray all together. Women pray separately. For them, that doesn't look right. Because in their tradition, men and women are all mixed up and pray side by side. We now have some Muslims trying to do that too, right? Huh? Huh? It's now become popular. Modern Islam or liberal Islam or whatever they're going to call it. So we do have this issue. But in general, you know, that's a fringe group. The mass of Muslims still follow the tradition, the basic principles that were laid down from the time of the Prophet Muhammad where the women pray separately from the men. And we can explain to them very simply that, hey, we're coming to the mosque to pray. When people go to the church, they go there to be on display. It's a whole different rationale. So you wear your, your Sunday best and, you know, most attractive and people go there and they eye in each other and look at, you know. It's a whole nother environment, a whole nother mindset. We're coming to pray. And if we were to mix up everybody with each other, and you're trying to make your salah and there's a woman bowing in front of you. It's not gonna, what's going to happen to your, your focus, your, your attention? That's natural. So it's better. The women pray together. They don't get distracted by the men. The men pray together. They're not distracted by the women. It just makes prayer easier. Stay focused. 
So, I mean, that can be easily explained. And of course, they will usually bring up polygamy. Men having more than one wife. That's what they mean. That's what they focused on. Why can't women have more than one husband? But just even before you get there, just men having more than one wife. They, they don't like this. Now they're the Mormons in America. They practiced it for, you know, how long? Till eventually they were threatened with their statehood being taken away from them if they don't stop it. So then the Mormon church got revelation. Huh? Polygamy is over. Right. But those who had doubts about that revelation, they still practice it. You got a whole sex of breakaway Mormons that still continue to practice. Of course, their polygamy is like unlimited. Guys will be there with like 30 wives, and, you know, uh, he's just the uh, central banker. All his wives are out working. He gets up all the money, redistributes it, and, you know, he's running an operation. <laughs> right. So it's a whole different perspective um, but of course the reality of polygamy that we can clarify for them easily enough is that it's everywhere it's everywhere every society every nation historically it's been everywhere in the world and when you see, sociologically speaking, when you see a practice which is everywhere like that, then know that it is natural. It is inbuilt. You know, the sociologists and anthropologists, they have this argument between nature and nurture. What is natural that you are born with and what do you learn from the society around? And then they identify principles of how you can determine what is natural. One of the things of natural is that it's everywhere. It's everywhere you go. People do it everywhere. And that's polygamy. It's natural. And there's rationale behind it you can go into to explain further. There are more women in the world than men. And, you know, men are being killed in the wars and, you know. You look at places like Syria and that now, you know, how many males have been killed? Males and females, but so many more males in war. Afghanistan, these other places. You know, there's a huge surplus of females. What happens to them? And so on and so forth. So these are just uh, some basic uh, concepts that if you're going to engage in dawa to your friends, your non-Muslim friends, you need to be prepared for. You prepare yourself. Even though you're going to do it in a natural, simple, light way, but you should be prepared. You should be able to explain this because you don't want to open a door and then they start asking you questions and you're, ah, oh, well, I really don't know. You know, it just makes Islam look more confused. Hmm? And in the end, the concept that you want to get across to those who after getting this clarification that you've given them, the big question that remains is, why Islam? Why not Christianity or Buddhism, Hinduism? Why Islam? So there are five basic principles that we would want to convey to them. The first that if we believe in God and God has conveyed his message to human beings 
So we're not deists, believing God created the world and left it to run on its own. Right? That's what the deists say. They believe in God. Because everything points to it. But that God communicated his will to human beings and that will is expressed in the form of religion they don't believe that part. The world is too insignificant to God. Just as we don't concern ourselves with the ants. You know, they're ants all around us. They have homes, they live in the ground. And but who spends the time to go looking into the life of an ant? It's insignificant. Our life is far more complex and, you know, it's unless you're a scientist who specializes in ants. So the same way that God, you know, God greater than everything in this universe, etc., for him to be concerned about us human beings. You know? You ever seen that um, image they made <clears throat> series of images where they show the earth. Then the earth in relationship to the solar system. right? And then the solar system in relation to the galaxy. Then the galaxy in relationship to the constellation. And then they go on a, and you see the earth each time in each level getting smaller, 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 to the point where the earth is no longer visible. It's just a speck, invisible to the naked eye. So God is going to be concerned with that little speck. Yeah, doesn't make sense. That's a whole nother discussion. But <clears throat> the point is that if we reach the level where we accept that God communicated his will to human beings. Does it make sense that he would communicate his will to one set with Hinduism, another set with Buddhism, another set Christianity, another set Islam, another set Confucianism? No. That doesn't make sense. That's just confusion. If there is one God, and there is one world, human world here. We don't believe in parallel planets and all these other kinds of things. It's just us. That one world with this one set of human beings. Then it makes sense that there should be one religion. Why would God give one to one and another one to another one? That's just confusion. If we're all the same, all human beings are human beings. In the end, it's just about human beings. Regardless of what area of the world we're born in, what we look like, we're just one. So one religion makes sense. So then, if one religion makes sense, that God revealed it, it should have some characteristics that make it the religion of God. And this is what we try to convey to them. First and foremost, the text of the religion should be intact. To know the religion, the revelation which came, it should be intact. We should be able to say, here is the revealed text of God. The only revealed text of God that we can say is exactly as it was revealed is the Quran. The Christians say, well, the Bible is the word of God, but their own scholars say it's not. There are so many different versions of the Bible, so many changes that have been taking place, 
written in languages which even Jesus didn't speak, etc., etc., etc. It's all kinds of issues. It's not the word of God. Not to mention the Buddhist writings, they can't really attribute stuff to Buddha, etc., etc. Secondly, the name of the religion, it should be in the text, should be somewhere. But if you look for Judaism, you don't find it anywhere. Look for Christianity, you don't find it anywhere. Hinduism, you don't find it in any text. So it's names given by people at different points in time. Whereas Islam is there in the Quran. Also, the name itself is not the name of a people. Judaism, the tribe of Judah. Nor the name of a place. Hinduism, Indus Valley. Hinduism, name of a place. Or a person. Christianity, Buddhism. It's the name of the concept of that religion, the essence of the religion. That is Islam. Also, its system should remain intact. If God revealed a system, then that system should not change. It should be fixed because God knows what's best for humankind. So when you compare Islam, the basic principles of Salah, Hajj, Wudu, Zakah, all these different things, from the time of Prophet Muhammad to today, Fundamentally, this has remained unchanged. It's the same religion. Whereas when you look in the case of Christianity, the most recent of the world religions, it's changed drastically. Drastically. And also, the last point, that the religion should be comprehensive. It addresses all aspects of human life. It shouldn't be only related to worship. It should have economic systems, political systems. It should have all of the various elements that society needs. And that cannot be said about the others. Christianity has no economic system, no political system. It's just religious values, principles. That's it. So you have to bring some other system from somewhere else. So these are the main points to highlight uh, at the end of discussion where people have opened up and they ask you at the end, so why Islam? Why not any of the other religions? All the religions say that they're the right religion. So why Islam out of all of them? So, that is <clears throat> the package this evening. Hopefully it will help you in your da'wah, in conveying the word of Allah, the message of Islam to those around us. And as I said, know that it is a duty on each and every one of us to carry this message.
We have to know our religion to be able to do it. Because if we're ignorant, then we will only confuse those around us more than they're already confused. So my advice is that you be engaged in learning about the religion, about the principles governing it. This lecture has been recorded. If you wanted to go back over it again and take the points out, which I mentioned, use it as a guide for you, then the masjid, I'm sure, is prepared to make copies available for you. They'll put it up on YouTube, whatever. You can watch it and extract those principles. I'll stop here. I, I guess our time is technically up. Maybe I'll take three questions and we can call it a night. Which what which three? I mean those that are uh, I see regularly. You know I mean you can ask the question and they, the others who don't see me. You know maybe give them the chance. So who? Okay, you're one person. Let me see. Let me see who's, who's number two, who I don't see regularly. Huh? Chance number two, and who would like to be number three? Okay, number three. Okay, number one, please. Okay, the question is sort of off the topic, right? The whole idea is that no, no non-Muslim is going to ask you that question, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? So, uh, I mean, I'll, since you asked it, I guess we we'll have to answer it, you know. But uh, we're looking for questions basically on the topic of our presentation this evening, you know. Uh, the question is, if you didn't hear it, um, if you forgot to say a surah after surah al-fatiha do you need to make sujood as-sahu for having missed that surah the general position is that it's not necessary if you choose to do so there is no harm okay so do we have a question now on the topic please alaykum salam The best way to counter the argument of the deist that God created the world and left it to run on its own. The best way is to get him to accept the idea that God, being God, should be most wise. As he is greater than everything else, you know, everything else was created by him, it must be inferior to him. That is logic. So, if he is greater than everything, he's greater in all aspects, his knowledge of everything, his power over everything, his wisdom with regards to the running of the universe that he has created. If they accept that point, then you can show that it doesn't make sense for God to have created all these human beings and not inform them of their purpose. We have choices. He's given us choices. As Choice between doing this or doing that. So, if we don't know what we're supposed to do, then how can God hold us accountable? 
And if he's not going to hold us accountable, then why did he give us a choice? The choice implies accountability. So this is, usually at this point, deists will back up and end up becoming atheists. Right? Because once you accept that point, then the fact that then God would have conveyed his word to human beings and everything else falls. Right? Uh, who was there? Replacement. Okay, brother's question is false propaganda of non-Muslims more dangerous or more damaging than Muslim malpractice? How many feel that Muslim malpractice is the biggest problem? Put your hand up. Let me see. Okay. How many feel that non-Muslim false propaganda is the biggest problem? Put your hand up. Okay. I think it's clear. 90% here feel that it's Muslim malpractice. So most likely it is Muslim malpractice. Well, what should we do about it? We have to correct our malpractice. It comes down to that. I mean, that's the way forward. In general, we do have to correct. You know, what is wrong in our societies, what is wrong in our communities, what is wrong in our families. We cannot succeed, cannot advance ourselves as a community, as a family, etc., without correcting what is wrong. So that goes without speaking, without saying we have to correct ourselves. And in order to correct ourselves, we have to have knowledge. So it means that we have to make an effort to learn about Islam properly in order that we may correct ourselves, correct our families, communities, etc., 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 so that is the knowledge imperative. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ had said, Talabu al-ilmi farida ala kulli muslim. Seeking knowledge is obligatory for every muslim. Because that's the only way to find the right way, to establish ourselves on that right way, and to stay on the right way. Third question. Alaikum salam wa Okay, brother's question, which was a multiple kind of question with multiple facets, etc. We can say in general, the final line you made, do we take into account the individual that we are addressing? Do we tailor this approach to Dawa according to that person's background or their approach or whatever. Yes, of course. You have to be flexible. What I just outlined is not a blueprint. It may work for many people, but not for every people, person. You know. 
So we do have to take into account uh, the person who we are addressing and modify our approach accordingly. I mean, this is just common sense. You know, there is no one way. Because even after you explain all of these types of things or you have to deal with them, what may be a key factor for one person may not be that important for another person. You know, so the Dawa, you always have to be flexible, open minded, well read. You know, you don't want to enter into this field in ignorance because you'll make things worse than they were. Inshallah. Okay. Barakallahu fikum. Subhanakallahum. Hamdika. Do you want to say something? Nashadu wa la ilaha la ant. Astaghfiruka wa natubu alayk. I thank you all for being here this evening and we hope that the presentation was of benefit. And uh, inshallah, every one of you that goes and gives da'wah to his or her neighbor uh, is added to my scale of good deeds. So I'm uh, I encouraging you, please, get out there and do the job. Barakallahu feekum. <laughs>